Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, today we're going to continue our classes on the book of Acts. And for those of you who are visiting, uh, we normally have our regular lessons. And as we go through our first principles classes, uh, we have somewhat extended lessons as we teach different books like the book of Acts. Uh, so today, the title of our lesson is going to be Forcefully Advancing the Kingdom. Amen? That comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, uh, where the Bible is the first century church was described as forcefully advancing and forceful men and women laying hold of it. And that's what we're learning to become here today. Amen? So let's jump on in here. Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Certainly as we go through the book of Acts, as we go through the first principle series, I, I, I really want to encourage all of our members to take the time and take advantage of this time to really know the book of Acts. It really sets the tone for what church is supposed to be all about. What we see in the scriptures is supposed to be what we see in the church. And so knowing the book, you can see when things are going the way they should and when they shouldn't. Amen? Awesome. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to start off with the persecution of Saul. Our first point is a zeal for the truth. Amen? Amen. Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul grew more powerful and began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Go over to Acts 9, verse 1. Acts 9, verse 1 through 5. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Wow. So here's this guy, Saul, and he's arresting both men and women of anyone who is identified as being part of the way. We know in the first century that people that were known to be part of the way and uh, people who were known to be followers of Jesus were considered to be a cult. And so to be known to be one as part of the way meant great persecution for your life. To the point, like Paul was trying to do, of taking them, not just putting them in prison, but like he was approving at the very beginning, killing Christians. Why was he persecuting so much? Well, because he was zealous for truth. It's hard to imagine, and yet, I was talking to someone the other day, and they're like, yeah, basically all wars up to about the 19th century, all major wars, really came as a prim the primary source was religion. And yet Paul was one of the most zealous for the truth. Yeah. Imagine how much conviction a person can have when they're zealous for the truth and they're off when they get the truth on straight. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, this guy was amazing. He was trained by the most respected Pharisee in Israel, Gamaliel. That's the guy that said, you know, if these guys are from Jesus, just leave them alone. Because if they're not a God, they'll die off. But if they are, you are fighting God. And yet here is Saul, his disciple, flat fighting God. But he was zealous for the truth. How zealous was he for the truth? Well, we can learn a little something from Paul here. He was so zealous for the truth that he took his mission house by house by house. How about it? Is that your conviction about the truth? You have the real truth today. Are you ready to go house to house and help this lost world come to have a relationship with Jesus? And yet we see there is no one that was going to stop this guy Saul. There is no way that was going to take him out. There was nobody that was going to stop him. And that's when the Lord fights for him. And so you see Jesus just 
bam, in, in the middle of the road to Damascus, this great light showed. I mean, you think of this guy. I mean, this guy's ruthless. He'll kill men. He'll kill women. He doesn't care. And Jesus' appearing in his life is so powerful that he just falls straight to the ground. Wow. You know, in our lives, when we walk lost in this crazy world, God has to show us a bright light to us and make us fall to our knees so that we will humble ourselves and learn the real truth. Amen? Go on over to verse 15. And yet every dog has its day, and that was Paul's day. In verse 15, then the real fun starts. So you say you want to be a disciple. You say you want to follow God. Well, we all have a calling, and Ananias got his this day. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, and you know, he put the exclamation point on there. The Bible doesn't lie, you know. He says, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Imagine that being your calling, huh? Woo! Check it out. It is your calling. How about that? Woo! So you get the call one day. Hey, I want you to go to Chicago. We need you to go to Dubai. We need you to go flat to Jerusalem for real Jerusalem. Let's see how Ananias responds. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. Check him out. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. You know, as a disciple of Jesus, God is going to have a day where you must go to someone who's dangerous. A day where you must go to someone who's been persecuting, who's been putting down the church, who's breathing out murderous threats, and help them know the truth that you have. Today was Ananias' day. I'm so glad that he didn't pull back from his calling. You know what I'm saying? When his time came and he received the call, he stood up because he had a zeal for the truth himself. Amen. And yet, I think about my own conversion. I had a zeal for truth. When I was five years old, man, I loved the Bible. I loved the Lord. We, we had a little program called Awana. And uh, you had like a little red vest. And every time you memorized the scripture, you got a little pin, you know. And so my, my vest was filled with pins. It was awesome. I loved church. And I remember, like, I wanted to get baptized. I had no idea what it was about. I didn't care what it was about. I just saw people up there. They come out of the water all, woo! And everybody clapped. So I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and so, of course, the church I was a part of, I went to a Baptist church. You know, my mom was a very religious woman growing up. And uh, she would drag me to church every week with her. And uh, my dad would say, he doesn't have to go. And she'd say, okay, we're going. And she'd take us. And, and when, at five years old, I got baptized. And uh, it was awesome. And, and yet one Sunday, because I was five, I, you know, I was one of those kids that escaped kingdom kids and wandering around. And, and I was wandering around the building. And I walked in, and I walked in on the preacher. And he was messing around with the secretary in the office. just like a dagger to my faith. And yet, I mean, okay, people have flaws, because that's what the religious world does, right? They make light of how bad sin is. Wow. But then I remember when I was, I think 12, and my mother was being beaten very severely. We had, we, I lived with uh, domestic violence growing up. And uh, my dad, I tried to stop him, and he grabbed me, threw me right through the mirror, the mirror door in the bedroom. And it broke apart. And I remember running out of the house just terrified. And I ran straight to the preacher. He lived about a mile away. So I just booked it all the way to his house. Knocked on the door. Pastor, pastor, come out. You have to come save my mom. And I remember he opened the door. And he was just drunk as a skunk. Wow. I can still smell the alcohol to this day. His nose was all pink. He's slurring. Uh, I just uh, couldn't help anybody. 
that was the day that I decided I'm going to find out the truth. But the problem was, I hated Christians. And so I grew up and I became a philosophy major. And I decided I'm going to study all the world's religions. So I'm going to just prove everyone that's not true and I'm going to find the truth. And I read all the books. I read all the Koran, the I Ching, Buddhism, and all the different, all the different teachings. And, and yet I could never get away from the Bible. No matter what I did to try and disprove that sucker, it was still true, you know? <laughs> just couldn't get past it. But I didn't believe there was a real church with real Christians because there was so much hypocrisy. So, so I had a zeal for truth, so I persecuted all these hypocrites. And I remember, I, I remember being at, at campus, and uh, the campus that I was on was uh, um, Fullerton Junior College. <laughs> And we had there was disciples that were there, and they'd come invite me. I, I could not make it. This was the zeal for truth they had, right? I could not make it from one side of the quad to the other without somebody inviting me to Bible talk. <laughs> and, man, I, I, in, I, I inferred wrath on all of them. And I shot down their life. And I, I don't want to talk about the Bible. Let's talk about you. What did you do this week? Yeah, you got sin? Yeah, uh-huh. I, I ain't going with you. Even to the point that one day a guy came in and... I was in the cafeteria, and I have, I'm got this creature of habit, so I got all my food lined up on the table, you know. I got my pizza, I got my Coke, and I have my hostess donuts, and, I, and I'm all ready. And so I, I'm just kind of weird like that, you know. And he comes in, and he says, he starts, hey, you just got to come out and check out this Bible discussion. And I was like, do you remember who I am? And he's like, yeah, you're the dude that yells at us all the time. Forget. What have I always said? He said, no. Okay, what do you think I'm going to say? Probably no. Yeah. And then he goes after me. He's like, dude, you just, please, you just got to come one time and check it out. Just check it out. And I was like, check this out. And I chased this guy out of the cafeteria with throwing food at him the whole way out. And, you know, I felt really good about myself that day. I felt really good about myself that day because I was out for truth. And the people actually stood up in the cafeteria applauding. And yet, there are people like that that are so hurting. They want the truth so bad. But your zeal for truth has to be greater than the hurt in their heart. Or you'll never get to them. And they're the ones that will go to Israel. They're the ones that will go to the Middle East. They're the ones that will die for truth. And so today, we have got to have that zeal for truth in our lives. Let's move on to verse 18. Verse 18. It says, immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, regained his strength. See, God provides us as those disciples that enter into people's lives at those moments when they're hurting most. Oh, and when you're hurting, you're not a nice person, are you? Like any of us. And yet we've got to have a conviction to break through the scales in their eyes and help them until the scales fall to the ground. A zeal for truth doesn't always equal the truth. But like Paul, like a Phineas, like the disciples we're reading about right here, we must have a zeal for truth to be the disciples that win this world. Amen? Amen. Secondly, a zeal to preach. Let's go on over to 9, Acts 19, verse, Acts 9, verse 19. Like it says here, after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished. And I said, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And by the way, he had no New Testament to do that. He used the Old Testament scriptures. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers lowered him 
uh, took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. Wow. It's very important about the ministry of Paul. Not only must we have a zeal for truth, but we've got to have a zeal to preach. Amen? Amen. Not everybody gets up here and preaches from the pulpit. And yet, what we see in the scriptures is an army of men and women who are committed and have a zeal to preach wherever they go. Come on. I mean, you, you, you look at this. Oop, lost my place there. You think about Paul's preaching here. Have you ever tried to preach to somebody and they just didn't want to hear it? Yeah. <laughs> this guy tries to preach. First of all, he's out killing everybody, going crazy, and he's got everybody confused. See, what happens is sometimes we become Christians and our old life haunts us. Yeah. And so he goes into the city and he's preaching. He's proving that Christ is the Messiah. And they're like, dude, aren't you the guy that's trying to kill all these people? What a joke. What's wrong with you? I just saw you the other day. Dragging a woman by her hair. And now, oh, now, you, now Jesus is the Messiah? And so they, they try and kill him. And, and so he's got such a zeal to preach, though. He finds out what they're doing, and he makes a plan to get around it. And so his followers take him at night, since they're guarding all the gates of the city, and they lower him over the wall, down the wall. And Paul literally became the first basket case in the Bible. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> And yet, that was Kip's joke. I stole that, by the way. Amen. It sounded funny. So. And, and yet, so often we can preach and preach and preach. And because we don't get the result that we want, we just flat give up. I mean, these guys preached to me for a year and a half. Okay, my mother, bless her heart, gave my phone number to every guy in my sector. There were like 300 of them. And they were calling me constantly. And I would, get away from me. I don't want, no, I don't know. Oh, my grandpa died. I can't come. I, okay, I'll come. And then not show up. It was just for a year and a half. These guys kept going after me and after me and after me. And we can get discouraged. Like I'm preaching and I'm trying and I'm, and I'm out there. And, and our next point's going to help with that. It's about prayer. And, and, and yet, we've got to have a zeal to preach. It's not about totally how effective it is. It's about our faith to just keep preaching the word no matter what. Because let me tell you what. A year and a half later, God gave one of those disciples the exact right words to say to me. He came to me because he knew I was a mama's boy, right? So, so because I'm a mama's boy, I, go, I got my mama wrapped around my finger. you know. And he came to me and he finally said the right words. He says, don't you want to know what we're teaching your mother? And because I had a zeal for truth, I was like, you're doggone right, I want to know what you're talking about. <laughs> and the first study, I didn't get it. But I wanted to study to, to learn everything I could. Second study, I didn't get it. Third study, it finally just hit me like a ton of bricks. Wow. The coming of the kingdom, I saw the Old Testament and the New Testament come totally together. And I saw the plan of God for the first time. And for the first time, I had seen real disciples who really gave all their heart and were giving everything they had. And they were not perfect, but I followed them because they were so wholehearted. What I, what I love about Paul is that he got right back up and went back in for another day and preached right back in that city. That's amazing. We've got to get right back up. You know, when I think about a zeal to preach, I, I, I think about our, our dear sister, Ana Hernandez. And, uh, you know, Ana got baptized with us when we were in Portland, and we have watched her over the years just blossom and grow into such a phenomenal missionary and disciple. And uh, I, I know even when she was down in Santiago, she called because all the money ran out and she couldn't stay anymore. And she was just fervently trying to find whatever money she could to stay there. And I remember get, we just gathered money from D.C., and we sent to her to keep her there. And she stayed there as long as she could because she's got that zeal to yeah. preach. Yeah. And I think about it, the Southland region. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, do you guys, I don't know if even all of you realize, the last five weeks, we've had 10 additions to the church here. It's an amazing, amazing thing. I mean, here's a, here's a region of people. You guys have had 
a third of our membership leaves to go out to different places, gone through a major transition and upheaval, and yet in 43 weeks this year, there's been 45 people baptized. That's flat phenomenal. Even last week, we got to see three people baptized, two people restored to the fellowship. We got to see, we got to see Louis and his wife united in Christ. That was amazing. That was amazing. We got to see Leela baptized. We got to see Cora baptized. And we have got to continue to have that zeal. But you know what? I think there's far more people with far more power with many more baptisms to come. We keep the zeal up. It's awesome. Verse 25. Verse 25. Through 30. This part's really important. It says, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in basket to the wall, opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. We saw all of that. We ended in 27. It says, but Barnabas took him, in verse 27, and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey has seen the Lord, and how the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved freely about in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria found a time of peace. And encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. You know, uh, is it, the amazing thing here is that they saw, okay, here's this guy. He's wholehearted. He's preaching his guts out, but everybody wants to kill him. We've got to help him out. And so they had to send him away. And when they sent him away, then the church grew and increased in number. And, and yet, they had to take a collection and take up money and send him away. And, and what, I, what I learned here in this particular study, because each time we do this, we I, as a preacher, you study the books. And I, and I learned something really cool uh, about what we do every year. In Acts chapter 2, we saw that the disciples sold their possessions and goods and gave to everybody as they had need. And they took care of their church locally right there. And, and then in chapter 4, they were beginning to travel around. And they saw, okay, there's needs elsewhere. And so they began to sell their homes and their land, and they gave all the money for the mission work. And then you see right here in chapters 9 that you got a, somebody who's become a partner. And they're preaching fervently, and they're out there doing it. And yet they need to be sent somewhere else. And so you, you, be, you see that the disciples' vision for their movement and what they were a part of went from their own little local group, like what we have right here, out to a larger group like our churches in the United States, and now they see Paul preaching to the Gentiles, they realize this is going to the ends of the earth with Paul. We've got to take up some money and send him out so that he can get to the rest of the world. And so that's an amazing, amazing thing, how their vision grew from a local vision to a church vision to a worldwide vision right there. And so that's why every year we take up our special missions collections. And, and I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us and encourage us here. The needs are great. Why? Because we have men and women like this who are preaching the word. They have a zeal for the truth. They have a zeal to preach. And they're out there doing it right now. And they have needs. And we take up these collections. We have got to expand our vision. And we've got to be behind our missionaries like we see happen right here in the Bible and send them what they need. Amen? We've got to be those partners that are, have a zeal to preach, to send them to preach, and then those who preach will send back to us. Amen? Thirdly, a zeal to pray. A zeal to pray. Let's jump on over to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Of course, in chapter 11 that we're skipping over, Barnabas and Paul went to Tarsus. Uh, they, they went there and they saw the evidence of the grace of God. And they, they were encouraged. And that's the first place we see the word disciple, that the Christians were becoming, being called disciples. And we saw the great numbers of people coming to the Lord, like what we're seeing here week after week. And, and yet, when that starts to happen, then real persecution really starts to happen. In chapter 12... Beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, It is about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. 
He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. Wow. It's getting real when somebody's head gets cut off. It's getting very real. It says, when he saw that this met the approval of the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival on the unleavened bread. Well, imagine we're at the GLC. And I know you guys love going to these GLCs, right? And imagine all the police come on in and they just arrest Kip. They just arrest Chris. I'd be good. I don't look like I'm part of this, so I'd escape all that. But, but imagine they just come in and just start seizing people. They're at a festival celebrating. And they come in and seize the leaders. Wow. And so we come to find right here as we move along. After arresting him, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four guards and four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Wow. A zeal to pray. I want to call us much higher in our prayer life. I mean, like light years higher in our prayer life. Amen? As I talk to people person, after, person by person, I come to find that all of us need an increased conviction about praying about the things going on in our lives. I mean, here their leaders are being arrested. They're being taken to prison. Some of you might like that, but amen. Just kidding. But in the midst of all of this stuff going on, it doesn't say that a few people prayed. It says the church earnestly prayed for Peter. That's super important because God answers our prayers. We have the Luke 11 prayer that we're given when we study the Bible. And yet right here is a time for an upward call that we really pray through things the way that we are supposed to. Our movement in 10 years has expanded from one church to 65 churches on every populated continent in the world. That is an amazing amazing thing. And we have got to be those disciples who don't just keep our eyes here on our local congregation, but expand our vision to the other churches around us, expand our vision to all the churches on all the continents, so our prayers include all of those. I remember when Dylan studied the Bible, he's like, I, this, like, praying for 20 minutes is like so hard, Dad. And I was like, all right, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You know, if you start praying for your brothers and sisters, how long is that prayer going to be? Yeah. Oh, man. If you start praying about every sin you've committed, how long? Is it? Oh, man. If you start praying about all the needs of those around, oh, wow. And yet if we go out to expand to every church worldwide, and we read the good news emails that are coming in. We see and hear about all that's happening. Yes. Guys, our prayers are going to really change yes. this world. In verse 6, it says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Now, what got me that when I, the first time I read it, I glossed over it. So here's Peter, right? You've got to imagine, how do these guys view Peter, this, this guy that's preaching? It says in verse 4 there that they had four guards and four squads. Sixteen guys on one dude. That's how powerful prayer makes you. So it says here, he's sleeping between two of them, right? Bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and some light shone in the cell. I imagine it was kind of like the light of Jesus. That... <coughs> And so he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, it's interesting why he would have to say this to him. Put on your clothes and sandals. Because when they put these guys in prison, they stripped them naked and put chains on them. So that they had no opportunity to hide anything, to hurt anybody. That's persecution. He says, thank God, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. 
You know, oftentimes that's what it's like when God is in the middle of answering your prayers. You just can't even believe that it's actually working. It's actually happening. Am I dreaming? Oh my gosh. And so it says here, though he thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. That's a lot to happen. It says, then Peter came to himself and said, wow, now I know without a doubt the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. I'm glad he figured it out. And yet, I don't think we're so much different from Peter. I think the Lord answers prayers of ours all the time. And we're so caught up in this and that that yeah. we just don't even believe it's happening. Wow. And the Lord's blessings just go whew, right over our head. And we miss it. And yet, we've got to have a zeal to pray with a faith that God will answer. Do you not know that the Bible says that God will give you anything you ask in His name? Here's the problem. You can't go, strike that guy down. Oh, in your name. <laughs> Take that guy out. In your name. It's got to be what God wants. Yes. And, and what happens is when we pray, we try and pray things that couldn't possibly be in Jesus' name. It's actually in our name. And then we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayer. You know what I'm saying? And yet, how did the other disciples respond when God answered their prayer? Well, let's move on here. It says, verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathering and praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without obedience and explained, Peter's at the door. Oh, you're out of your mind. This sounds like disciples for sure. When, they kept, when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, well, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And then, of course, the things we can gloss over, Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. Why? Because they all finally got it and realized God had answered their prayers to get him out. And so he motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and describe. They must have been be able to heard a pin drop when he's describing this. He described how the angel of the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. Because of course we want to send to the world as God answers our prayers. So more and more people believe that God will answer theirs. We've got to have a zeal to pray. You know, some of you have dreams. And you need to pray. Some of you have challenges. And you need to pray. Some of you have things that you just flat think are not just a challenge, but impossible. And you really need to pray. But you need to pray earnestly and consistently, fervently, with great faith, especially when things don't look like they're going to work out. That's when God's really testing your faith and your heart. But most of all, love always trusts. He's always testing your trust in Him. I think about, you know, the time of special missions always brings up a lot out of people's hearts. And I know for me and Trace, this particular giving has been one of the toughest of all of them. And uh, we're, we're, we've been, for a number of weeks, $400 short of our goal. And there's only four weeks left. And so I've been praying and I've been praying and I've been praying for God to uh, give us something or some way to do it. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, our, our son, we have a son with special needs and the medical bills and things just always keep coming in. And they always come at just the wrong time, if you know what I'm saying. 
Isn't it amazing like when special comes, the car breaks down, the medical bill, get a ticket, just, you know. By the way, this corner right over here, watch the light. So, yeah, yeah, if you drive through that light, it's a $500 ticket if you run that red light on the corner right there. I see the head shaking, some of you that got the ticket already. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And yet, and yet, as I prayed, you know, God waits for you to just get to the point where you're like, fine, he's not going to answer it. And I, sadly, to my shame, I got to that place. And then this week, I mean, I was just like desperate. I'm like, oh my gosh. I wonder if I have any unclaimed money in any of the states we moved to. And I went online, and sure enough, online there, $240 owed to us from the state of Oregon from our taxes, a tax thing that we didn't get back. It's like, wow, that's awesome. I need 400, God. <laughs> you know, a couple days go by, and, and, uh, and I'm sitting there, and um, is it yesterday or the day before? Yeah, it's yesterday. Yesterday I checked the mail, and, uh, and I open up this envelope, and it's one of those blank envelopes, and you're like, all right, this is going to be nothing. I open it up, and there's this lawsuit with Wells Fargo for people who had accounts opened illegally, and I had accounts that were opened illegally, and they sent me $148. And so you go, 300, 240? Oh, that's like 400 bucks. That's exactly what we need. I'm, I only have to come up with 10 bucks now. That's awesome. And God answered that prayer. And I really think if your heart is for the mission, if your heart is really in it, if you really want to take care of your brothers and sisters and you're willing to pray, God will give you a way. Let's go on to verse 18. The Bible says, In the morning there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience after him. After securing the supports of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to spread and flourish. Don't ever get down when you think the world has won. Herod took one of God's own and cut his head off. And none of the disciples could do anything about it, but God had something to do with it. God flat took care of him and the guards. Don't make no mistake. You are God's child. Anyone that messes with you messes with God. And he will deal with them in his due time. Amen? Awesome. But we have to have a zeal to pray if we're going to forcefully advance this kingdom we're a part of. Number four, zeal for mission. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Verses 1 through 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Certainly there are those who are set apart for the work of God to, to go. And yet, I think we can so easily forget that God also sets apart the work that's here, yeah. not the yeah. work that's out there. Just whether you're here or whether you're there, you are set apart from this world. Yeah. And you're set apart to preach. You're set apart to pray. And you're set apart with the truth. Yeah. As we move on here in verse 4, The Bible says, the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Wow. You got John Mark there. 
who's the helper for the missionary journey. If you don't remember, John, the first time we see John was as a little child. And they had persecuted the disciples, and they all fled, and someone grabbed his cloak and ripped it off, and he ran off a little naked boy, running from persecutors. And now here he is, the helper on a missionary journey. It says here in verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed, oh, I already read that, sorry. Verse 6, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? Now, I love this part because you see Paul reliving what happened to him. Now the hand of the Lord is against you, and you are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And I'm sure inside he's going, just like I had to deal with. <laughs> Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, and he was amazed at the teaching about our Lord. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be people who try and poison you about our church. There's going to be people who talk in private meetings. And you know what? The Bible says very clearly there will even be some amongst us who begin to grumble and moan and complain and take away from the work and focus on men instead of the mission that we are all about. We've got to rise above that and be about the Lord's work. You think about this. Go on to verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it. And it did not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the, for the word of the Lord. And all who are appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread to the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Check out verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. Wow. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. <laughs> Barnabas they called Zeus. <laughs> and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city's gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Saul heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out in the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news. Telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not let himself be without testimony. 
He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and the crops and the seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch to Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into that city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Woo! I mean, we see all the disciples, they all get nicknames, you know. And we think, that we think you know, nicknames are pretty cool. You know, I, I nicknamed Dylan D-Time. So... But yet these guys didn't get a nickname. See, because they had such a zeal for the truth, because they had such a zeal to preach, because they had such a passion and zeal to pray, God made them so powerful that everyone thought they were gods. Like, wow. And, and we've got we've to see, like, that is how God will make the world view us eventually. If you are committed to these things, you'll be more powerful in your speech, in the impact that you make than you could ever have thought possible. Now, I know every one of you sitting here when you were a kid had a dream to change this world. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And yet, God has a plan that is so much bigger than the one you had. His plan is for you to be so much more powerful than you ever imagined in changing this world. And yet, when that time comes, if you're like Herod, you won't give praise to God, you're gone. He'll take you out through selfish ambition. And yet... If you give God all the glory and praise, and it can be hard to, because people want to be with someone they can touch and feel. And so they'll turn to you instead of God. And you, as you get, bring people around, must keep turning people back to God. Keep turning them back to their prayer life. Keep turning them back to their mission and their purpose and who God made them to be. So they keep following God and not you. I just love Paul's grit. They beat him to death, and he gets up. We're going back. I can just imagine the guys. Are you crazy? You want me to go back in the middle of that? Absolutely. They think we're gods. And yet, I put before you, that's church. That is church. This right here, this ain't church. All right? This is a time for us to worship and put our mind on God. But church is preaching the word like this. Being out there as partners in the gospel, making a real difference in this world. Church is not gospel and music and nice hats and dressing up and, hi, it's great to see you. Church is getting into the nitty gritty of people's lives and helping their lives change for the better. And church is supposed to be fun. Far too many make it like, oh, what a dry, let's go share our faith. Oh, no. Let me tell you, if you're going to share your faith, you're not sharing anything. You're sharing your bad attitude, not faith. And then nobody will come out with me. Let me think. Passion to preach, passion for zeal, passion for the truth. That's when people come. That's when people come. And the only way, let me tell you something. You cannot get that from this lesson. You cannot get that from a discipling time. You get that when you get in your Bible and you know the truth and you get grateful for what you have. And yet we live in the United States of America. How about that? That's pretty awesome. And yet in the U.S., church is supposed to be like going to Disneyland. Let me go. I wonder if I'm going to go see my friend. What ride are we going to go on? What's the, the lessons, the ride? Woo, it's going to be great. And yet, church is not really that great unless the people sitting around you are your actual partners. Ooh. See, I, I, you know, I, I went and visit my sister this week, and uh, it's pretty cool. Her, it, my sister was, was supposed to die in childbirth because she's got a rare vascular disease. And uh, by the, mir the miracle of God, she was able to have her baby. The baby survived. She survived. It was really awesome. And, and it was funny because... Uh, her husband began to go after me a little bit uh, about all the hypocrisy of Christianity. And uh, 23 years later, I'm paying for all of my shenanigans when I, before I became a Christian. And so I welcomed it gladly. 
And he's going off a little bit on, on all the hypocrisy and all this stuff. And, and so I began to describe our fellowship. And I began to describe how I know most of the members of the church and, and, all, and you guys know me and, you know, I'll share my sins and different things from the pulpit. And uh, so he goes, what about, what about the money you give? Yeah, what about all that? What do you do with all that? I see these guys flying around in planes and all that and Mercedes. And, and I go, did you see what I drove up in? <laughs> He's like, and I said, you know, every year we do our financial thing. And I actually bring my bank statements and my credit report so that people can see it. Because I want my church to know how I spend my money and what I do with it. Have, I'm just as accountable to them as they should be to their, their fellowship. And he's like, all right. And, uh, and I had brought up confession. He's like, I don't get this confession thing. I don't get what it's for. And I said, hmm, do you think that nobody will like you when you say what's really going on in your life? Well, well of course. Well, everybody knows everything about me. And I go, I share my stuff from the pulpit in front of hundreds of people all the time. Oh, but you don't say everything. Well, yeah, I do. Get out of here. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. Everything. Yeah, everything. I don't buy that. And, and, and it was an amazing thing because my sister had studied the Bible when she was 16. My dad told her I was in a cult. Now, she's been in a confused state with this because my dad got baptized 19 years later. And yet now, when it gets down to it, I could just say, I saw the light go off in her eyes. Like, wow, my big brother shares everything with his wife and the people around him. Wow. Because they don't do that. And let me tell you, you cannot be a partner in the gospel unless you're willing to share everything. You can be great friends without being a partner in the gospel, and what use is that? But you can't be great partners in the gospel without being great friends. And to be great friends, you've got to be transparent. And you've got to share your stuff. And I explained to him the bond that comes from sharing all your gunk and the other person sharing all of theirs and then helping each other with the scriptures to make every effort to do what's right. I believe we'll get him. And yet, people want church to be just fun. You know? Because we live in America. It's Disneyland. And today, if you don't have a sense of purpose and a sense of mission, church is not very fun for you. Because it's all based on how everybody treats me and what everybody says to me and what everybody does to me. What am I going to get out of it? And yet, real disciples come in to give. They come in to share. They come in to worship with their partners who they know and are close to. When it stops being fun, they don't flee. See, because they're not here for fun. They're here for truth. They're here to preach. They're here for their mission. I'm so proud of so many in our church. Uh, I think of uh, Jimmy Idris. You know, let me tell you, Jimmy's had a go of it, man. He's had a rough time. He's given his wife a very hard time. And yet she's forgiven him of the things that have gone on with them. And it didn't deter him from sharing his faith with Louie. And Louie, you're an amazing guy. I appreciate your heart. Louie wants to be a part of ICCM, I found out. So, that's a true disciple. Start talking about, well, I don't know if I'm the business. I can just uh, this go ICCM. I'm like, yeah, this guy's cranking, man. This guy's awesome. That's why his wife got baptized the following week. And yet, we can have sin go on in our lives, and God blesses our repentance. Yeah. I think of Mario and Bertha. And, you know, Mari and Bertha, they baptized their daughters, and, and yet their, their aunt was having a few challenges, move on in with them, and what do they do? They share their faith with their aunt, and their aunt gets baptized a couple of weeks ago. I think a little Jasmine Jennings met Leela. You know, Montserrat met Cora. And I just got to challenge you today. How zealous for, are you for the mission of God? How many people are you sharing your faith with? How many people are you partnering with to study the Bible? Do you realize that the work of God, Jesus called it his food. He says it's what nourishes me. It's what feeds me. It's what drives me. It's what makes me healthy. Do you think it's any different for us? The work of God is what sustains us and solidifies us and makes us strong. And so today, I just want to pose one final question. 
What are you living for today? What are you living for today? If you're stuck in the problems of life and conflict, you know, if you're visiting, I want to encourage you to get with the person that brought you. Go through the Bible studies that we have. And they'll share with you how these studies changed their life forever. How the truth brought them out of their challenges. And take advantage of why God brought you here today. There's no mistakes of why. If you're a disciple today and you've just been down, it's time to get back up. It's time to get fired up so that we can all go up. The first century church forcefully advanced this gospel all over the known world. They had a zeal for the truth. They had a zeal to preach. They had a zeal to pray, and they had a zeal for their mission. Today, that is the church that you are a part of. And I want to encourage you to be a vibrant, active member of that church today. I love you all very much. Let's take a brief fellowship break, and we'll come back. For communion.